Okay, I'm so pleased to share and discuss with you about the new technology related to dental implants, specifically UV technology with you today. And uh, if I could signal the emerging revolution in implant dentistry, that will be my excitement and honor. And today I divided my presentation into four chapters. Well, first off, I'm gonna present about what is the titanium aging. You know, it's called the biological aging of titanium, but basically titanium ages. I think it's most of you heard of, heard of it uh, for the first time. I'm gonna talk about it at the first chapter. And second chapter, we'll uh, talk about the discovery and challenging of UV photofunctionalization, or you could say UV activation as a solution for it. Because number one, biological aging is unfavorable a discovery. It's it's crucial discovery, but it's not that the, the great for the implantologist or implant scientists. However, we got the solution. So number two chapter, we'll talk about the solution, which is called UV photofunctionalization. And third, um, I'm going to talk about the new dawn of the next generation UV technology. Uh, even though we talked about the UV photofunctionalization at the second chapter, we already have the next generation. So which will be uh, defined uh, defined differently, differently from the existing UV photofunctionalization. So even though the, today is actually the dawn of scientific promotion for me about the UV technology worldwide. However, you know, science started 10 years ago. That's why I'm going to give you the history of the UV photofunctionalization and then new generation of photofunctionalization as well. That will be the uh, chapter three. And chapter four uh, will be the emerging new norm uh, using a technology, a UV technology for the expanded use beyond OS integration. Okay, that will be the, the last chapter. Okay, and let me, let me begin the background introduction a little bit. I'm gonna give you a little bit, uh, two things, just two things about the background behind the UV technology. One, so I counted the number of publication with the keywords of titanium and surface. So we're trying to understand how how is a trend or what is the demand uh, for the people in the world, including dentists and patients, and also the pure scientists because a lot of people uh, exists uh, in the engineering field, the engineer field, the medical field, working on titanium surfaces. And then this is a result. It's keep increasing. Number of publications keep increasing. You know, for example, last year we got 2,200 2, uh, publications just for the titanium surfaces only. The thing is, this indicates two things, one, you know, titanium research, as titanium surface research, got a popularity. It's still on the increase a lot. And number two, despite this, you know, excitement and the heated up, you know, trend of uh, the research uh, numbers, we still don't have a good surface since 30 years ago. I think everybody noticed, everybody was aware that uh, so-called micro rough surface was invented and developed and then it became available for the patient care. That was early 1990s. So since then, you know, in the past three decades, however, we do not have a better surface than that. So this is, you know, the scientists and developer, dentists, uh, that everybody in the world, including me, probably is, should be responsible and not delivering the better surface in the past 30 years. That's this. That's the implication that this you know, statistics uh, tells us. Okay, and then into as an introduction, what is the OS integration? I think everybody learned that that that's defined as a direct contact of bone uh, with implants. This is the blue area is a bone, and the contacting with the titanium that is black without soft tissue intervention. That is a definite at the microscopic level. That is a definition of OS integration everybody knows. However, so this is the really the ideal scenario. This is a reality. So we have a barn here facing the implants. However, we have a soft tissue intervened right here. 
uh, starting growing from here. And another uh, picture we're seeing right here with, with uh, we have a tissue void here. There's nothing here. And then around here is a soft tissue and a bone is away from the implant surface. This is a reality. Uh, I would say based on uh, the, the extensive search of the literature, I would say 50 to 65% is the maximum of the ulcer integration. And the thing is, we have a lot of fibrous tissue intervention and the tissue void. And uh, nobody, I would say nobody uh, answered the question, why this happened? Another, in, in other terms, why ulcer integration never be 100%? no matter how long we wait for healing. So that's that simple question we had at the beginning uh, since I established my own uh, research team. And then we try to address and deliver the answer. Okay, so those are the introduction. And then about uh, 10 years ago, uh, this is a researcher, WA, Dr. Weil at. He might be joining today. He's now the chair and professor of the Tufts University Prosthodontics. And then he prepared the titanium disc like this because we routinely, routinely prepare titanium discs, discs for the experimental purpose. So the reason of the flat surface is that we can culture the cells, uh, culture the osteoblasts on them. And then we just simply acid etched as uh, a lot of companies do, you know, to create the micro rough surface. Dr. Wildad did the acid etching and they placed the water. This is just a small amount of water, 10 microliter of water on there. And this is what he got. And then another researcher on the same day did the same thing. Researcher Horia Nori did the same thing, you know, spreading a 10 microliter, but, but it, it turned out the water spread on the right side, but not on the left side. And then we thought about it, why this happened. So this was equally acid etched. It's with the same protocol, a very consistent protocol. And then it's been stored in the drawer of a lab. And the uh, room temperature is just the same because this is this was, was the same moment we did these experiments. And then we, we looked at it into what was the difference? Maybe we did the bad job to, uh, when you place in the water in there. And maybe water quality was different between the left and right, but turned out uh, nothing didn't answer the question except, except they are uh, in a different age. So this is a very old one. And this was the one week old one. Okay, so this was three months old and this was one week old. That was a difference. And then when we systematically examine how the water dynamics changes according to the age of titanium discs. So this is the results we got, you know, from the day zero old titanium, which is immediately after acid etching to the three months old one at the room temperature at the atmosphere condition. And then the things we, we're seeing here is a degradation of hydrophilicity from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. At this point, at least, for the water dynamics, we see the aging of titanium. We don't know yet about the biological effects, but at least we see the physical uh, degradation. If hydrophilicity work out better, but we don't know yet. So we continue the research. But at this point, but that's the start of the biological aging. And then what about the commercial dental implants? So we needed to uh, look into uh, a lot of dental implants from different companies. And then as many as we looked at into, no exception. It's all hydrophobic. That's why we saw it, you know, because water doesn't spread at all. It remained as a circular, which means hydrophobic. I would say, you know, if the contact angle is greater than 90 degree, it's more than hydrophilic. And some people uh, want to call it hydro repellent. So a lot of implants you see here, I mean, all of the implants in the world are hydro repellent. It's more than hydrophobic. Okay, that's what we saw it. And then what about placing implants into water instead of placing a, a water on top of it? So we see a lot of air bubbles happened without any exception. Again, sometimes we see the big bubble and 
sometimes we see the micro bubbles. And uh, if you can imagine, this is a blood in the patient's jawbone. So probably this will be the tissue void. I mean, this will be the bone void because there's a air bubble in there. It does no access for blood and cells to go into the implant interface. So this is what it is for the commercial regular implants. Okay, and then now I'm gonna get you a little more proof how how the water uh, placement worked out, and then also can we rejuvenate? So let's talk about it. This is a brand new implants from a company, and we're placing implants, uh, we're placing water on top of it, like a three micron water there. And then within the water, you see that a lot of micro air bubbles in there too. Okay, and then we tried to regenerate it because our hypothesis was that the newer the titanium, hydrophilic, more hydrophilic the, the implants. That's why we re -acid etched. You know, this is an in-house acid etching because we do this uh, routinely in-house. That's why we try to re recreate the new surface and immediately after water spread like this. So this is a clear evidence that yes, we are able to regenerate we rejuvenate the hydrophilicity. And then what about the sunblast cells, sunblast surface? The one we show was the acid surface, but this is a sunblast surface from another company. And then we saw the hydrophobicity. Now we can rejuvenate the hydrophilicity by doing another sunblasting on top of it. Yes, we can. Yes, we can rejuvenate hydrophilicity. So this hypothesis, this proved the hypothesis that yes, titanium aging happens and that we can reverse it. We maybe at this point we cannot prevent it, but we can reverse it. Okay, that's what we got. Okay. And then and then it's not the only uh, hydrophilicity loss. That's not that's not the only one we're losing. More importantly. The, the slides I'm showing right here is much more important than the hydrophilicity degradation. So what it is. So this is a titanium surface, which is, has been acid etched. And then we measure the surface atomic percentage using XPS. It's called XPS. It's a cutting edge technology. And then we compare the new titanium and therefore we call titanium. So as the as, much, as many as the elements there, we can see as a peak. Let's say titanium surface, you know, like a dental implant surface has O, T, I, and C, because T, O is for uh, titanium dioxide. That, that's why we have a lot of oxygen in there. Of course, we have a lot of titanium in there. But the thing is, we have a lot of carbon on the four we call titanium, a lot, a lot more than the new titanium, which is just here. So the, the height of the peak represents the, the percentage of, the, of this particular atomic. That's why we if you quantify it, this is 60%, 16% uh, carbon in there on the new surface, as opposed to much bigger, 62% on the four we call titanium. The titanium, um, titanium oxygen, and oxygen percentage were pr uh, pretty similar in between the old and new. Of course, it changed a lot according to the, this change, but the ratio between the titanium and oxide uh, didn't change much between the old and new. But the biggest difference, considerable difference is the carbon percentages. And then using another technology, you can map the carbon on the titanium surface. And along the peak of the micro, micro rough surface, we have a lot of carbon. And then also valley areas still have a lot of carbon as well. So when you see, probably you're convinced 62% of the area, so which is actually a percentage area, literally more than half of the dental implant surface is covered by carbon in the form of molecule. And a particular molecular name is hydrocarbon. We as That's why red dots, you can see extensively all over here is the dots of hydrocarbon covering more than half of the dental implant surface. Okay, so this happens over time naturally. 
So this is nobody's fault. This is a natural phenomena, carbon accumulation all over the titanium surface over time. That's the primary reason of the biological aging of titanium. And then, you know, loss of hydrophilicity was the secondary concomitant phenomena. Right. Again, primary, uh, the phenomena of the aging is a carbonization. And uh, secondly, uh, degradation of hydrophilicity. Okay, now we're going to the, the biological experiments. We basically look at the number of cells attached on the differently aged titanium surface. Because to make the also integration happens, of course, we need osteoblasts, right? And then we compare it. Uh, uh, before going to the, uh, I'm sorry, before going to the osteoblast research, I'm just doing the one more time, the percentage of carbon. It really increases rapidly according to the age of titanium. So when you look at the four week one, again, 62% of the surface is covered by hydrocarbon. That's the uh, demonstration of the aging. And then other literature showed and looking at the how much percentage of carbon in there on the commercial implants, and they agreed 67%, 51. You know, there was a great variation. You know, maybe good one is around 33. But anyway, it's unpredictable. And uh, between 35 to 75% with the great variation. And dentists uh, has no clue to know what kind of percentage uh, the dental implants uh, they are using uh, for the patient today or tomorrow. So that is a kind of unpredictable thing because it depends on the age as well as the quality control the manufacturer do, uh, as well as a kind of storage condition in your uh, private den dental office. But anyway, a lot of carbon there uh, without, except, without exception on every single implant. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the biology. So we need a lot of osteoblasts. That's why we looked at the number of osteoblasts uh, three hour after seeding onto the titanium disc, which is four week old titanium discs. And in this uh, scope, we see two osteoblasts attached. Usually three hour is, is very difficult for osteoblasts attached. That's why this is making sense. Only three osteoblasts attached in, in this larger area of the titanium surface, and then they didn't spread it because it's too early to spread. You know, this is about, you know, 10 micrometer, uh, 10 micrometer in diameter, uh, which is just, just normal, okay? And then what about the new surface? You know, immediately after acid etching, because we can do the in-house acid etching, we are able to create new surface. And then we did the same thing, you know, trying to see the cold osteoblast on it, and then we took a you know, confocal microscopic picture like this. Obviously we have more number of, much more number of cells and then they spread already. They accelerated to initiation of the function. Okay, and more number of cells and also expedition of the cell function. That's we can get just by using the new surface compared to the old surface. Okay, and then these cells are gonna make the also integration happen. So it probably you can easily imagine also integration will be large and faster uh, on the new surface compared to week four uh, old dent. See, you know, lamellopodia, philopodia look like a cell projection already started in three hours. And as a cell biology, this is really the amazing results, okay. And then now we look at the function of osteoblasts called alkaline phosphatase activity, ALP, at the day seven of culture, comparing the same thing, comparing the new and a week four old titanium, plus in between, two week old, three day old, we have a clear trend that the you know, more red, the better ALP activity, which means more uh, stronger osteoblast function to make mineralization. That's why we have a clear trend according to the age, you know, we, are, we have a degradation of osteoblastic function. And when you quantify, it's a clean trend as well. So the age of the titanium and the function of the osteoblast, unfortunately in the inverted correlation, okay. And then what about the histology? We, we wanna see the bone formation in, in, in bone actually. 
you know, this is this is defined as authentication. And then using animal model, uh, we use the rat model. Using animal model, looking at the week four healing in the rat female model, comparing with new titanium and week four uh, titanium. So this is a histology. We usually, you know, we used to see it. So this is a bone, as I said in the second slide today, the bone formation is not ideal all the time. I mean, most likely, you know, best also integration only 60%. That's why we're supposed to see the fragmental bone formation like this. And this area did not have any bone. So this is a just normal as we see it, okay, in the literature and in the past, our experience. And then what about the new bone, a new titanium? And we have a bone formation extending very smoothly, consistently, without any you know, soft tissue intervention at all from here to here. So this is a new, a beautiful phenomena of osteointegration. We happen to see using just the new implants immediately after the acid etching. So the new or old implants make a lot of difference. When you quantify the bone implant contact area, at the week two, early stage of uh, rat healing, we have 2.5 better bone implant contact, almost 75% compared to the old implants having only 30% of the BIC, bone implant contact BIC. And then we thought about it, you know, this probably difference will be, will be kind of diluted as, to, as time goes by. When you wait for longer healing, probably it's not going to be no difference at all. But uh, against our anticipation, we still have a good advantage of the new titanium, which shows that over 90% of the BIC right here, compared to 58% uh, of the four-week-old titanium. Well, we can make a, a permanent difference like this. It's not just the acceleration. It is the increase of the final accomplishment of the bone implant integration. That's the power of the new surface. Okay, right here. All right then, and then we continue uh, to the second chapter, but let's summarize it, what we learned from here. Summarize, okay, number one, the biological aging is a natural surface carbonization over time, okay? That's nobody's responsibility, it's a natural. Just like a computer screen, keep collecting dusts on it because this is an interaction between target and the surroundings. That's why it's a natural phenomenon. And then number two, surface hydrophilicity disappears as a secondary consequence. It's a concomitant effect. So people tend to think, oh, hello, any problem? You okay? Okay, okay, yeah. People tend to think, you know, hydrophilicity is the first, uh, first manifestation, but it's not. Carbon is more important, okay? Because of the carbon, the, the titanium will start to lose the hydrophilicity. Okay, number three, together, the aging degrades the also integration capability of titanium. So both of them, uh, carbon, carbonization and hydrophilic, hydrophilicity degradation, both contributes to the also integration capability degradation. And number four, there's no way. This is unfortunate news, but there's no way to prevent the, ti prevent the titanium aging. However, the good news is there's a way to reverse it. No way to prevent, it, prevent the titanium aging, but there's a way to reverse it. And the better news is that we can get much even better than the original new surface. I'm gonna give you a little heads up, but that's the one, uh, chapter two and three and four. Okay, let's move on. And then very long story short, we needed the measure to, to solve the biological aging. We didn't publish until we got the solution because we didn't wanna be pundit or just criticized without providing the solution. And then, we just happen to have the solution, which is a UV treatment of the titanium under the certain condition. Now it has to be optimized under certain condition. Okay, and then this is a power, and let's learn a little bit about the UV. As you see, just below the visible light, that's a UV light. 
which, which uh, wavelength is less than 400 uh, to 10 nanometer. So below 10 is X-ray. So we have a ultraviolet light here. And then when you look, you know, a lot of coming from the sun, as we know, but you know it's categorized into UVA and a UVB and a UVC. And a UVA and a B, you know, that's we, we get from doing the sun temp. You know, it's coming through the ozone layer to the earth, uh, coming from the sun. However, UVC does, does not penetrate the ozone layer. That's why UVC cannot, you know, cannot come to, to, the, to the area we live in. So if you want to use a UVC, you know, we have to create it artificially. Uh, although you know, UV A and, A and B uh, keep coming from sun. So that's what it is about the categorization of UV light. And then when you specify the wavelengths, it's defined like this. Okay, right. And then we started out using, using a kind of reasonable price UV light. It's called the bactericidal UV light, you know, emitting UV A and UV C. This is what we usually see in a, under the cell culture cabinet or probably a lot of area in a science lab. And then this is a very weak one. And then power is not that great. But however, this is the one we started out uh, 10, 10 years ago as a solution of the biological aging of titanium. And we did the 48 hour treatment UV light. And then this is the results. The before and after 48 hour UV treatment using a bactericidal UV light. So this is a change we can make. Even the low power UV light, you know, make a difference kind of opposite. We can really reverse from hydrophobic to hydrophilic, just like we reversing the aging. Again, we, we couldn't prevent it, but we can reverse it. Okay, and then what about the carbon? carbon percentage on the surface of the aged titanium. As I mentioned earlier, we have a 62% carbon unfortunately accumulated in the old titanium surface. And but the question is, can we get rid of them you know, to the new area, or to the new surface? And it turned out, yes, we can. We can reduce the carbon contaminants into uh, 14% which is very similar to the new titanium surface. That's why we are able to reverse the aging. Okay, and then what about, the, what about the biology? So now I'm trying to show you again, it's similar to the, the aging results. We look at the number of osteoblasts attached between control implants, which is aged, which is aged and then UV treated. Again, this is a, a original publication based on the 48 hour UV treatment, okay, using a low power one. And then you see the obviously uh, the vivid image shows a, a great contrast about the number of cells attached. So there's a five time more number of cells attached and also expedited cell spread. So everything is bigger right here compared to a circular, uh, the cellular shape. So you can consider this, if this is immediately loaded implants, probably you want to choose this implants because if it's immediate and a micro movement happens on the surface of the implant and these cells are going to come off very easily. However, these probably is going to stick to the implant surface, make an awesome integration happens in a subsequent healing. So this is a power again, not just the number of osteoblasts, not just the quantity, but the quality of the adhesion and the function. Okay, even though you know, the, this is a 48 hour treatment, it works pretty good. Okay, now we look at the, the subsequent stage of cell culture, because it might be just a, a speed issue. That's why we just continually uh, examine the number of cells in a later time, of the cell culture. So previous slides was uh, only the uh, three hour after seeding. And uh, even after day five of a culture, you see the double the difference in cell number. So not just the attachment, but cell proliferation, cell growth have a great influence, uh, have received a great influence from the UV treated implants. And obviously, you know, this will continue 
to day 10 and the day 20 because there's a limit of uh, the, the old implants because of the elbow balls, because of blood limitation. That's why we can easily speculate that the, the results that I show in the, the histology BIC, 90% uh, versus 50% between the new implants and old implant, probably this number of cell uh, explain the results of the histology that I showed in the aging chapter. Okay, now we see the calcification ability of the osteoblasts. You know, the more brown, the better the calcification and the better, the larger the calcification. So we see the clear difference. It's much robust mineralization on the UV treated titanium surface. You can see the results from here as well. Okay, now this is a histology. So around the control implants, week four healing in the wrap model, around the uh, control implants, we see just the regular OS integration. Some area successfully had OS integrated like this, and some area is successfully OS integrated, but some area is not because we have a soft tissue intervene, soft tissue intervene. However, when you treat the implants with a UV light, so there's a continuous bone formation with no soft tissue, and just you know ju juxtaposing very intimately all around the surface, around the UV treated titanium surface. Okay, and now this is a quantification. Bone implant contact on the y-axis. Okay, and then we have we compared again controlled and UV treated surface and the early stage healing, and then late stage healing. Okay, at the early stage, and the, the control implants has. Uh, 25, um, around 25% of bone implant contact. And then it grows to 45% at later he healing stage. And then what about the UV treated? At the early healing, we got 2.5 better uh, uh, BIC, okay, over 60%. And then even though after a longer healing time, we still maintained advantages compared to control implants. So almost kind of double uh, the bigger, uh, the BIC, okay? And then when you look at the number of bone implant contact, it's 98.2% for the UV treated surface, as opposed to only 53.2 for the control implants. That's the difference we can make by using a UV technology. And early stage, the difference is much more greater, okay? We can accelerate the bone healing plus we can increase the final level of the bone, he bone healing also integration. Okay. And then, you know, seeing is believing. So this is the most beautiful uh, histology of also integration uh, ever happened in history of the bone and implant science. When you look at the green area, which is bone around the black titanium implants in the rat femur model. So when you see the bone area without any soft tissue here, from here to here. When you magnify it, actually, I'm sorry. When you magnify it, you see here, still bone is there as well. But anyway, so when you, when you compromise the examination and it just, you, you just count this area as an absence of bone, that is okay too. And then, but turned out, but the most of the area is covered by, the, covered by bone after the UV treatment. So this is the results. And then again, SEM also shows a clear difference between the regular implants and then for UV photofunctional as the implants. This is a rough femur. So you can see the bone marrow here. And then when you look at the control implants, so let's magnify it, you still see the bare titanium surface, like a micro rough titanium surface there. And this is a new bone formation. So average wise, when you, you know, make a ballpark, let's say 50% of the area is covered by bone. The BIC was 50%. Compared to this, when you look at the UV treated implant surface, entire implant surface covered by robust bone formation with the little bit trabecular bone formation still continue the growing from the bone marrow aggressively. So that's the difference we can make. Okay. And now we're gonna look at the strengths of bone implant formation. 
Okay, strengths of the all cell integration by using the rough FEMA model uh, pushing uh, pushing technique. So let me, let me explain. This is an important uh, experimental protocol. So this is a rough FEMA. You can see the knee joints right here. And uh, close to the knee joint, we place implants. And then after a week two or week four healing, we sacrifice animals and they take out the bone and they embed it into the acrylic uh, resin. And this is a bone with the implants placed right here after a certain healing time. And then we place onto the uh, mechanical testing machine instrument and it simply we pushed the implants so that the implants will go into the bone marrow and they break the osteointegration. integration. So when you monitor the displacement of the pushing rod and then uh, the force required to displace the implants, and you will see the breakage point, which is which is defined that strength of osteointegration. integration. Okay, so we actually measured and compared the between the control implants and the uh, UV treated implants. Okay, and then week two healing and week four healing. Take a look. So this is a control as 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 big as, as strong as right here. And the week four, yes, we have an improvement because the healing progress is we have a better, better also integration strengths for the regular implants. And then what about the UV treated? It's three times better at the early healing stage compared to regular implants. And then what about the week four? We still maintain 80% or, uh, yes, 80, I would say 80% better also integration than the regular implants. And then particularly, let's focus on well, early stage of uh, strengths of osteointegration. integration. Okay, regular implants, usually when you wait for week two, week four, and week eight healing, it, it just correlatedly, correlatedly increased like this, you know, up to the 50 Newton of the strengths of osteointegration. integration. And then what about the UV treated implants? UV treated implants, even after only week two healing, got the value like this. So this value is equal to somewhere around here, somewhere between week four and week eight. Probably it's very similar to the week six. So when you interpret from here, UV treated implants got the equal number of uh, strengths of OS integration at week two, to the one regular implants get at week six. So six divided by two from here, we can say that the OS integration was expedited three times, accelerated three times by the power of the UV. Okay, that's the in vivo results. Okay, and now I'm gonna show you a couple translational studies. Okay, from now on, you know, a couple, couple study used either, you know, very weak bactericidal UV light, 48 hours protocol, or 30 minutes protocol. It's a little bit advanced version of the UV. It's called low pressure mercury, UVC, UVC. And then, you know, those are used uh, together or either of them are used for the, the next couple of research. Okay, you know, animal research still continues because translational before clinical. Okay, this research compare short implants and long implants because we wanna increase in a, in a clinic, we wanna increase the, the indication for short implants, you know? And then we hypothesize because UV implants have the larger area, uh, bone implant integration. That's why maybe short implants is, is work as strong as the longer implants. That was a hypothesis. So this is, Six, uh, 40 percent shorter than the longer implants, and then we just placed, we just placed into the rat femur, and then with or without uh, UV treatment uh, ahead of time. Okay, so let's compare it. And then first off, I'm going to show you the strengths of OS integration. Str again, strengths of OS integration using a pushing test for uh, the longer implants, and uh, this continues constantly as we expected, uh, as healing goes by from week to week eight. This is just the regular uh, regular, uh, the regular results we expected. And then what about the short implants? 
So now short implants, how disadvantageous you know, short implants has. Let's take a look. You know, week two healing didn't change much compared to long one. But when you look at the week four healing, we have only the half strengths of the osseointegration integration compared to long implants. And it's still very uh, cons considerably low osseointegration integration compared to low implants. I mean, compared to longer implants. And then what about the effect of a UV treatment? We treated the short implants with UV, and then we saw how it goes, how we can catch up to the longer implants. You know, our expectation was we're trying to be similar to the longer implants. That is more than more than ideal, and it's good in you know, serving as a perp, uh, hypothesis and expectation because we can increase the indication of the of the short implants. Okay, and the results results turned out much better than longer implants, double the better than longer implants at the early healing stage, even though it's a short implant though. Again, this is a short implants with the EVTRIN is actually the equivalent to the longer implants without EV treatment. And the same thing happens. So we can overcome, we can overcome the shortage of the implants. I mean, short length of the implants by using a UV. So that's the power. And then next, we try to overcome the simulating the simultaneous uh, GBR. So let's say when you place an implant and you know, without a cortical bone support. So this is a bone marrow of the rat femur. And the bone uh, implants will be placed into the bone marrow without the cortical support because we created the half a meter gap here, half a meter gap here on the ball side, 30, 336 degrees surrounding. And then we just simply, you know, hand, we created the hanger so that the implant is not going to move out from the femur. And then compare the bone healing uh, between the UV treated and non treated implants. So let's take a look at the results. Okay. And then again, we evaluated the strengths of OS integration by the push in test, the same you know, femur model that I explained a couple of slides ago. And then this is a power of a strength of boss integration for the implants with cortical support. It is a regular implant placement, cortical support. And uh, what is the disadvantage of the implants placing the without the cortical support? So this is the one. We only got we only got one fourth of the bone os integration here. It's very compromised because it, there was no uh, cortical support. And probably the subsequent, you know, also integration probably compromised as well. Not just the, you know, innate bone absence, but the bone healing has been compromised. That's what we expected. And what about if you treat the implants with the UV and then place it into the gap model without cortical support? So this is the results, right? So this is with the gap, but we treated with the implants with the UV light, and then we received the similar strengths of OS integration after the week two healing. You know, just like a bone support was there. So this is a effect that we can create. And then when you look at the micro CT here, so this is a micro CT around here without, without any UV activation. So, and then with, there was a gap. That's why bone formation started to, from the external area, but it's very far the, for bone to reach to the implant interface. This is what we saw. So this is a result of very weak strengths of OS integration. And what about the UV treated? You know, and as you can see here, very great contrast, very easy to see. Bone formation started at the interface and created and expanded all the way to the, the other side of the bone. And plus, you know, bone formation started uh, from the surrounding as well as well. So this is a both-sided bone formation happened compared to only one-sided bone formation of the regular implants. This is a difference we found between the non-UV and the UV treated surface in the gap healing model. So we can, this implies that in the bone, UV treated implants have a benefits for the simultaneous GBR model. Okay, and then what about the clinical study? Only two introduction because of the lack of time. I'm trying to introduce 
as much as we can. And the clinical studies, actually they used 20 minutes activation because at this, at this time in Japan, in Japan, they created the, the clinically available device uh, from Ushio company, and uh, which is a 20 minutes version. And uh, another one is a 12 minutes version. You know, this, this device does not have any uh, UV protocol exposed. That's why it's a proprietary UV, okay? And then this is a 20 minutes uh, activation uh, using high energy UVC. And uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm trying to uh, mention that, how do they you know, activate the implants? So when you see the implants is, you know, let's stand over here. So this device requires us to unpack the implants. So this is a risk of contamination, but we have to unpack it. You know, there's no way we can activate uh, the implants uh, still boxed because you know, the UV device, uh, UV ray cannot penetrate the UV container, I'm sorry, implant container. That's why implants have to be uh, exposed like this for the direct exposure, okay? And then these in the clinical pictures, you can see the difference. It's a hemophilic surface after the UV treatment uh, uh, using either the, the devices I just showed, okay? 12 minutes or 20 minutes activation. This is again, you know, differences you can make between the regular and the UV treated uh, the implants. And then this is a study I'm trying to explain. Uh, this actually did a lot of um, uh, the retro retrospective study and looking at the many implants, uh, as many as a 222 for regular and a 168 for the photofunctionalized implants. And uh, most of them are complex cases like simultaneous sinus lift and GB on the fresh extraction uh, immediate placement. And then these, these are the example. This is a revision surgery. And then this is a bone, uh, the, the final simultaneous GBL surgery. Uh, again, the most of them are uh, very complex cases. And then they measured the ISQ value at the implant placement and at loading. And then they divided, divided this number uh, by the healing time they waited. Again, this way we can standardize the speed of our integration. So this is the, the index they created, you know, so that we can standardize it. You know, we cannot just compare the ISQ cross-sectionally, right? You know, because nobody, uh, everybody has a different healing time. Okay, to make it, a, to make a comparison happen, they divided the ISQ difference by the, uh, by, by the number of days, okay? That's what they did. And then this is the results. They compared the ISQ, again, ISQ increase divided by month. I'm sorry, not the days, but month, okay? And then OSI represents OSI integration index, speed index. Okay, and they compared between Tai SLA, and then unspecified brand names with UV treated titanium surface. Okay, and then this is a number of Tai and there's a number of for SLI. And this OSI are different depending upon how stable, uh, what kind of primary stability the implant had at the time of placement. Because, you know, but the SLA was much bigger performance when the stability was pretty, pretty poor. You know, ISQ was uh, uh, less than 50 at the time of placement. You know, that makes sense because more acceleration happens by the power of the micro rough surface. Anyway, in a different brand surface like this. And then, but the thing is, when you look at the UV treated titanium surfaces, we have overwhelmingly better uh, OSI number compared to the ones we showed here. So, uh, you know, the time, uh, multiple time, uh, the Expedited expedition plus increase of loss integration was three to 20 times, depending upon how poor the primary stability is. And there was a trend that the poor the primary stability, the bigger the performance, UV activation can make a difference. But anyway, three to 20 times bigger. And this is another study published in Germany. And again, 55 acid edge photofunctionalized implant placed 
in a very low or extremely low primary stability cases. So this is a case study. And then this is a the example uh, of the implant placement without any bone support. And uh, you know this is a simultaneous vertical GBR necessarily. And then this is a video clip I borrowed from Dr. Kitajima. And you know he is placing implants without any primary support at all. So you see the implants really shaking here. And that's why Dr. Kitajima trying to uh, change the angle and trying to re-screw uh, re uh, the implants. But it's still, it's very low stability because of the lack of bone. Okay, this is just a one example of the video clip. And then study found over 50% of the implants had ISQ of 50 or less. And the fiber implants had ISQ of 40 or less. Fibrin implants has no primary stability because you know, he was not able to measure it because implant, you know, the smart peg uh, was, was extremely impossible to place it on because of the lack of stability. And then success rate was 40, uh, 54 out of, uh, out of 55, you know, one failed. Okay. And the thing is, even though how low the primary stability is, this is ISQ value, UV treated implants acquire uh, the ISQ value the bigger than 60, and then most of them are bigger than 70. So this is the results. And then when you categorize, depending on the, uh, the level of the primary stability, so this is the effect, effect of the UV photofunctionalized implants. We got the good primary, uh, uh, we got the good stability at uncovering surgery, even though it was low, and then it was even lower primary stability, got the similar, uh, the final stability as well. And this is the same. And then there was a trend, you know, no matter what, how low, how low the primary stability, at the end, we got the very high uh, the implant stability. So this is the proof that the proof that UV treatment uh, was able to overcome the very challenging condition even though ISQ initially was less than 40 or unmeasurable, okay? And then let's summarize the second chapter, number, number one, UV photofunctionalization decarbonized titanium and concomitantly regenerates hydrophilicity. And the BIC got 100% in the animal model and the three-time acceleration in the animal model, okay, as an effect of UV activation. An animal clinical study demonstrated UV is able to mitigate and overcome the unfavorable host conditions. However, the challenge we identified, long exposure time, 48 is definitely not acceptable, and uh, 12 minutes, 12 minutes may be okay, but it's still too long, and a 20, 32 may not be acceptable. So we need some countermeasure to overcome this thing. Another problem is that implants needed to be unpacked because of the, the container doesn't, doesn't allow the UV to come along. That's, that's a problem as well. And the FDA is not going to approve this device. And then another problem that, that I didn't mention is that no maximum effect identified because, because the company is trying to sell it 12 minutes, 20 minutes. However, uh, we didn't know maybe 15 minutes is better or 25 was better, or we could do just six minutes using this device, or we could do uh, 10 minutes activation using the 20 minutes device. That, that kind of effect, those dependent effect was not examined. That's why you know, these three problems needed to be solved for the next uh, generation UV. And then again, this is a three categories of UV and then DO and UCLA looked at the another category of UV, which is below 200 nanometer, which is called the vacuum UV, VUV. So that's the new category of UV and we're trying to exploit it if it's effective, if it's effective to activate dental implants. And uh, this is called the xenon excimer UV lamp emitting 172. Again, 
less than 200 nanometer wavelengths. Okay, so this looks like a uh, xenon lamp here. A xenon is atomic number with uh, with atomic number 54 and atomic weight 131.294. And it's been used recently, as you see this one very often. Most of the luxurious car nowadays have a xenon lamp. So this is a high high technology, and we're trying to implement to the dental implant field. Okay, and then create it. Again, a DO and the UCLA co-develop the UV device, particularly for dental implants using the xenon excitement lamp. Again, 172. Okay, and then for those using the UV technology already, you know, this is a, just a familiar video. You know, we just simply unpack the implants and then the implant is uh, contained in the particular quartz ample in the DO products, and I would, because it's keep, it kept in sterile, okay? And then placed into the UV device, and then started the program. And then they started to count down from 60 to zero. So let's expedite the process, okay? Another 14 seconds here. And then this is, again, the new implants without any UV treatment. You know, as a comparison, we're trying to show. So let's place into the, the experimental level cultural dish here so that, that we can show, we can demonstrate the water dynamics. So this is, again, this is a UV treated already. One minute UV treatment. And then we're trying to place three microliter of water on top of the both implants. Uh, this is a, not really implants. This is an experimental. Uh, 16 six millimeter uh, the width here, and then four millimeter width here. It's much a little bit bigger than regular dental implants. Okay, so this is without a UV treatment. As you can see here, this is a hydrophobic surface, or maybe we can say hydrolyte pollen. So this is after the UV treatment. Again, one minute using UV UV treatment. So this is a difference we can make. We reversed it. We reversed the biological aging of titanium, you know, in terms of hydrophilicity. Okay, now, so we look at the carbon decarbonization uh, capability. So we're trying to dissolve this methylene blue. So the blue you see is a methylene blue. It's a molecular uh, I don't know, hydrocarbon, just similar to the hydrocarbon that is accumulated on implant surfaces. And then compare UVC and then two commercially available device, you know, like, like I showed, 20 minutes one and the one, uh, 12 minutes one. And then this is a new uh, VUV from DL. Okay. And in this case, for the fair comparison, we did the one minute, one minute decomposition of carbon because carbon decomposition is a most useful indicator to look at the, to evaluate the power of the UV source. And then this is a thing. With the VUV, which is DO1, the all of the blue almost gone. We can see the clear uh, transparent uh, liquid here compared to the original blue. Uh, whereas UV, UVC and a PUV still have a blue remain here. Okay, you, you see the clear vivid a difference that VUV can make. It's a, it's a remarkable difference from the original to here within a minute. Again, this is a, this is a one minute uh, protocol applied to all of the four devices. Okay, and then you know, as you can see here, let's take a look. You know, I'm trying to show you without any editing so that you can trust. This is a very blue one with the methylene blue. We placed into the UV device, VUV again. This is a DO in VUV device and a 60 seconds counting down. Let's accelerate. Okay, here you go. Okay, almost there. There you go. So it's a clear and transparent. Okay, so this is a difference we can make. You know, XPS results something invisible for us. 
but using a methylene blue, it's a hydrocarbon, it's visible uh, by human naked eye. You can see the clear difference from here to here by the power of the VUV. So as opposed to these uh, competitors, there are still a remaining methylene blue here. Okay, now, so we looked at the, a lot of things, but the, let me expedite my presentation. Next, we needed to find out where is the maximum performance of the VUV? Because as I mentioned, we need to identify the peak so that uh, we can tell the technician, uh, we, will, we can tell the clinician, you know, maybe one minute is just good enough. You don't have to do two minutes or maybe 40 seconds is good enough. But we have to know where is the maximum effect of the VUV activation. And then we run this one. So by changing the activation time from 20 seconds to 100 seconds using the VUV, and we found 60 seconds is almost plateau of the, U, of the methylene blue decomposition. You know, no matter how long you wait, after six seconds, doesn't make much difference. When you quantify, this is the results. When you, when you follow the white, white circle, you can see the great drop of the methylene blue decomposition up to the 60 seconds, but not much 80 or thing. When you follow the black one, which is more important because this is with titanium in there. So with the titanium in there, you know, we, we can expect some photocatalytic activity of the UV effect. That's why 60 second is just the bottom of the, uh, of the methylene decomposition and a no gain from here. Okay, that's why we are able to identify the 60 seconds, which is one minute. That creates the maximum effect of the VUV light. Okay, and then another thing is use of ample. As you see for the those, as you see here, as you already know for those, uh, already know about the uh, UV technology up from DO, the implant is sold in the container like this. It's called quartz ample. It's made of quartz, not a plastic, not a product. That, that's why when you drop it, it's gonna break. It's like a glass made, made of quartz. And then this is a particular material uh, that permeates the UV. Okay, that's why when you do the quartz ample, decomposition, you successfully decompose, but when you, when, you, when you do the same thing in the plastic tube, you cannot decompose the methylene blue, even with the VUV. So this is a power of a cold sample. It's not gonna impede the, the UV, uh, UV penetration. Okay, so that's another technology breakthrough so that the, the, the clinician can treat, with, treat the implants without UV, without compromise sterility. That's another breakthrough. And then, you know, it results in the FDA approval. And another thing is that if this is a low test. We try to know how good is a VUV. No matter what, we have uh, so much uh, the, the bigger contamination. As you can see here, from here, you see the much more uh, concentrated methylene blue. So let's see uh, if the implants you have in a storage, two years old, and have a lot of carbon contamination. But even, even that situation, the VUV can decompose the most of it, as opposed to the another competitor UV sources has still a lot of methylene blue uh, the remaining here. So this is a, the, the graph uh, compiled based on the data here. So UVV, uh, you know, when the contamination loaded one time, two time, four time, and eight time, UVV can continuously uh, correlate it, they can decompose the contamination. Whereas other UV sources has a plateau. They cannot decontaminate anymore if the contamination is too much. So there's a limitation, okay. That's another advantage of the VUV treatment. So let me skip it. And the biology, what about the biology? We did experiments. Okay, I already showed this one. That's why let's skip it. 
What about the biology? We still don't know how good is the, the, the deal, the xenon, excimer, UV lamp, make a performance biologically. So we run experiments comparing control and a VUV. Okay. And then we culture the osteoblasts. So I'm, I'm trying to introduce the results of the human osteoblasts. So we see it like this. Okay. And then this is the results of the day five, five days after seeding cells onto the, onto the uh, DO rough surface called HSA, DO rough surface called HSA, with or without uh, the VUV treatment. Okay. And then, you know, we trend, we, we change this, uh, the exposure time from zero, which is control, to 20, 60, 100, and 140 seconds. So we're trying to identify the plateau, hopefully, so that uh, we can uh, we can tell the technician, the lab, uh, the clinical, uh, the people, you know, 20 seconds is good enough or 100 seconds is good enough. Okay. And the results turned out, you know, control is as low as this and 20 seconds make a three times difference. Very good. Very good performance in terms of the number of cells at day five. It's a very good results. It's much more than the, the conventional UV technology. And then what about 60 seconds? It's greater. It's amazingly greater. It's 10 times greater than the control. And then what about 100? Very, very interestingly, you know, it reached out the plateau, or I should say plateaued out, and then started to decline. And what of 140? It's very low. It's still better than a little bit better than the control, but it's not as good as these UV activation. So this is a very important phenomenon that you know we have to optimize it. And we have to deliver the clinician the optimized message, which is 60 seconds. Okay. We don't we don't want them used 140 seconds protocol. So it has to be 60 seconds, okay? So that's the message. And then what about the alkaline phosphate activity, which represents the osteoblast function, which we looked at the consistency here, here, right there. You know, 60 seconds and it showed the best performance. And it plateaued it out right here. So from here, you know, 20 seconds may be okay, but uh, it doesn't matter, you know, 60 seconds or 60 seconds in terms of the uh, the clinical viability. That's why, well, why not? We can get the maximum effect by doing a one minute activation. So that's, we, we learned it. Okay, and then what about the, you know, the seeing is believing, you know, we trying to visualize a number of cells on the VUV one minute treatment, number of cells obviously uh, the greater compared to the regular titanium surface. And uh, they are spread much more and uh, much more dense. So from here, you can, you are convinced that, uh, you know, five or 10 times more cells attached onto the VUV activated uh, implant surfaces. Right here. Great. A lot of cytoskeleton there. And from chapter three, a novel, the xenon excimer UV, VUV emitting 172 nanometer shows unprecedentedly high capability of decarbonizing titanium compared to previous light sources. With VUV, decarbonation and the regenerating hydrophilicity reached the maximum in a minute. That was a breakthrough. Specially designed the cold sample did not compromise VUV. One minute VUV activation maximizes osteoblast attachment and function. VUV has solved all technical challenges the predecessor UV had. The treatment has been newly defined VUV photofunctionalization and clinically termed V activate. So, this is a different from UV photofunctionalization because we're using a completely different source of UV, a VUV, V activate. And then opportunity expanding, not just the OS integration. And then probably you know, I'm going to indulge, if you can indulge me in another 10 minutes, I'm going to show you as much as I can, uh, what is the expansion? What do you mean by the expansion of the UV technology beyond OS integration? 
or a biofilm. And we still have a dilemma, like everybody aware of it, dilemma of the implants in terms of osteointegration integration and the bacterial fibrosity. You, you wanna make an implant rougher and rougher to get the osteointegration. integration. However, that will compromise because that, that will attract a lot of bacteria, compromise the bacterial fibrosity. When you're trying to you know, prioritize fibrosity, you're gonna compromise the osteointegration. integration. And the thing is, what can we do? Is there any way to take in between getting okay also integration and okay bacteriophilicity for this city? But probably that's not a good idea because we compromise both because there's no way to get the maximum on the both sides. And our idea is that why not? We just break the common sense and then you know, make the rough surface bacteriophobic. So, so that we can meet both sides, the maximum uh, the requirements. Okay, so, but the question is, can we do that? And then we compare the regular titanium surface with or without UV. And then this is a result of the machine surface. By using a UV activation, we can reduce the amounts of biofilm form. This is a, the purple one is the, the oral biofilm formation on titanium discs. This is a human oral biofilm. We just cultured it. And by using a pretreatment of UV, we can reduce to one fourth of it. We can make the titanium surface bacteriophobic and a biofilm phobic. And by knowing that, we're trying to, trying to reproduce it on the DO surface with VOV. Okay, the results turned out. So again, this is a 12-hour cultivation of the oral biofilm on the control DO implant surface versus VUV treated DO implant surface. Okay, this is a difference. A lot of biofilm is there and there are very few biofilm there. That's the difference. And the thick when you measure the thickness of the biofilm, it's as thick as like this, 15 micron already even after 12 hours, and a very, very thin biofilm. You know, we don't call it biofilm, only the bacteria uh, attached. You know, we can make it zero, but we can significantly reduce from the left side to right side by just simply uh, VUV treatment for one minute. Okay, so this is the results of the 24 hour. We still maintain the very low, the bacterial uh, biofilm property, Again, it's not the zero, but we can significantly reduce, like half reduce. And then what about the fibroblasts? Can we do the UV treatment on the healing abutment, for example, to promote the healing, to stabilize the soft tissue, and then also to acquire the soft tissue seal? That's the question because we have a significant problem, long lasting problem or periodontitis. It's a worldwide problem. And then what about the effective UV treatment. And by doing the UV treatment on the healing abutment, we, after culture of fibroblast, we got uh, a lot more cells on the UV treated surface, again, VUV treated surface. And then after, after the next day, we got much more proliferated fibroblast on the UV treated surface compared to control you know, like a red carpet all over on the healing abutment. So this is a new strategy. We can enhance the soft tissue seal. Okay, you know, this is a result of the quantification there. Okay, and then this is a demonstration that uh, we can do. This is a healing abutment from DL and then we just place into the stage you can ask you know, the sales rep to get the, the stage and then let it stand and we do the one minute treatment. The protocol is one minute. It's the same as the Austin integration. So the difference is that this is a direct exposure. There's no ample direct exposure and then optimize to one minute. And then let's take a look. Okay, and then let's take a look to see if this is a hydrophilic or still hydrophobic, as same as a regular uh, healing abutment. So let's say, let's ex expedite it. 
So this is a regular healing abutments. And this is a UV treated uh, healing abutments. Let's place water there. Okay, this is a regular. Okay, as we expected, because this is a regular titanium, it doesn't matter as it is or machine surface, it's a hydrophobic, hydrophobic. As opposed to that, we have a UV treated surface, clearly showing the hydrophilicity. So that's the difference we can make. And then it makes sense, a lot of fiber brass attached there. And uh, why not other uh, peripheral components pass possibly we can do the UV treatment. So that will be the expansion or new, uh, the trend of implant dentistry using a VUV technology. Okay, so let me skip this one. Okay, because of the lack of time, I'm trying to wrap it up. Sorry about that, but if I have another opportunity, I'm gonna uh, be happy to show this one as well. Okay. Okay, UV treatment provides success. We believe success in security and the speed and the spreading it means it's more indications. And safety means we, have, we don't have to use the old implants because we can rejuvenate implants. Now, of course, speed is accelerated loss integration. And the security wise, you know, we, we previous study demonstrated marginal bond maintenance is better around the UV. So those are the indication we can uh, indication we can give uh, by use of the UV technology. Five S. Okay, and then summary for summary: uh, VUV treatment of titanium significantly reduce oral bacterial attachment and a biofilm formation. And this is called a VUV induced bacterial fibrosity. And two VUV treatment of implant abutment increases oral fibroblast attachment of function. This is defined as a VUV enhanced soft tissue seal. And number three, surface hydrophilicity drastically improved blood flow and recruitment of blood and protein. I am sorry for that, and I skipped just the slides. And if number four, VUV photofunctional laser provide implant dentistry with five S, just like showed you in the last slides. And then, you know, last couple slides will summarize about how we can evaluate implant surfaces. This is a conventional, the formula for OS integration. OS integration can be evaluated as the integral of these alphabets. So what you mean by them is that primary stability, of course, and bone quality, and then systemic conditions, and the healing time. These are the doctor and the patient's factors, as you can see that. And what is the MRT material? because grade commercially pure titanium is better than you know, the titanium alloy. That's a material. And about the roughness, basically the rougher the better. You know, when, in terms of the roughness value, you know, 2.0 is, is one of the best in the, in the current implants. You know. And then T is like a topography. It's a qualitative assessment. However, the more compartmental, peak and valley structure, the better. That's the topography. You know, this is controlled the manufacturers. But in addition, we just learned H and C, which is hydrophilicity and carbon. So this is a new understanding of our integration as opposed to the conventional uh, until recent. And the thing is, these two factors are severely compromised by naturally titanium aging. That's why we got the opportunity to restore uh, or even maximize it by the VUV. And then this will become the doctor's and manufacturer's control together because DO will provide the UV technology and the ample quartz amples and uh, particular implants and then as well as the device using a cutting edge VUV. And then doctor has the opportunity to use it and we can together can overcome the challenges that have happened by the aging here. Okay, and then DO has a very good uh, the micro rough surface. This is one of the best. Not just I'm saying, but let me show you the quantification. So this is a 30 implants. 
30 implants in the market showing a say, which means average roughness from 0.26 to 2.23. And you can quantify the roughness. And then when you quantify the DO roughness, this is a categorization here, the DO roughness reach even better than the, the number one current number one implants in terms of roughness. So topography is very good already for DR implant surface. Okay, and then this is the thing. The power of the implants is determined again by the material, roughness, topography, and hydrophilicin and decarbonization, you know, from the one to 10 scale. And a DO has a good material and a good roughness, which is 10 and topography is 10. However, we have only one for hydrophilicity and one for decarbonization because carbon contaminated without any exception. That's why we're just using just half of the potential, half of the potential, which is even okay, but uh, we got opportunity by using a VUV activation. We got all 10 because we can maximize the hydrophilicity. We can clear it up a carbon here. We can make most of it or all of them, the potential of the DO UV implants. Okay, finalizing, this is the last one. What is the VUV photofunctionalization? Which is, it makes the titanium implants and components to world most advanced surfaces with the best oil integration, soft tissue seal, and the bacterial fibricity in one minute. I think this sums up pretty much. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogawa, for that presentation. So um, we actually have a few questions here, but uh, to anyone that wanted to ask more questions, um, you could raise your hands and um, you know we could answer all that. And also to start it, uh, we actually have um, a deal promotion right now, a very exciting offer year end um, with the UV Active. So if you uh, wanted to start off your um, UV Active um, um, activator product, we can actually help you out. Uh, I'll send you the details. You could contact us on our phone number that we'll be providing you and email address as well. So the first question that we receive is um, with titanium aging, where does the carbon um, come from? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Carbon is everywhere in the atmosphere, you know, just simply surround us. And then that's why when the implants is packaged, you know, inside a package is all full of the carbon in turn in a form of CO2. Okay. And then sometimes there's hydrocarbon in there too, you know, air, uh, hydrocarbon in there too. Plus, plus, you know, case is made by plastic as well for most of the implant company. And even though it's a case is made of metal, the surface of the metal has a carbon in there. So carbon is basically everywhere in the atmosphere and on the hard material. And then implants, implants and new implants really started to interact with the surrounding. Then it accumulates the hydrocarbon without any exception. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, next question, can titanium aging be avoided by special implant packaging? Yes. One of the misunderstanding is that why don't we sell the implants in water? Because people want just the hydrophilicity, right? That's why they got idea, you know, they sell the implants in water, but that's wrong. If you place the implants in water, it's a water contamination. It's a, it's a simple, it's not the hydrophilic surface because water is already there on the implant surface because it was, it's been in the water, right? And when you placed water-soaked implants on water, uh, with water, of course, it's, it looks like a hydrophilic because it spread. Water on water, it, it will spread it. So, but, but again, this is a water-coated implants. That's the not a bad idea. And then research already demonstrated that water-coated implant is just equal performance to the regular implants. So much lower performance than the UV-treated implants. 
UV treated basically, we remove the carbon and expose the titanium as it should be. So that's the idea. Approach is totally different from the water soaked implants. And then other method, can we prevent the carbon contamination? Unfortunately, we can't. If you vacuum, if you vacuum the implant container, which is impossible, which is impossible, but the steel surface of the implant case has a carbon there. That's why at the end of the day, we still have a carbon contamination. But anyway, it's impossible to vacuum completely. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Can DO activator be used for other brand implants? Yes, that's a good question as well. So everything is a good question. And then answer will be no. As you as you and learn from my data, that each implant has to be optimized for the UV technology. That's one thing. So if you see, if you remember the data that I show, if you treat the implants. Uh, 140 seconds, the effectiveness is gone already, you know, for the DO surface. So that's why we have to do the same examination, every single implants available in the world. That's one thing. Another thing is that, you know, we have to expose the implants. If you're trying to use a DO device to other brand name, we have to expose the implants, right? Because it's in a plastic container which is not approved by the FDA. Yeah, so FDA you know, tells us we have to use the implants directly from the container to the patients. That's why you know, I, I would say we, we can't treat other brand name with the DO implants. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. next question. What is the type of hydrocarbon formed? Are there any solvents from hydrocarbons that could use instead of UV? Right, to chemically remove, actually mechanism, I, I needed to skip the mechanism how to remove the hydrocarbon by the UV. It's actually direct bond dissociation and also photocatalytic activity. And plus the power of ozone created by the UV. There are three mechanisms, like I said. And then we could do the three mechanism by using something extremely expensive technology, you know, like a plasma or something. But the plasma, I would say, we can remove the carbon. However, we're gonna destroy the surface. That's why strictly, strictly speaking, we can't. We can't. UV is the best one. We can remove the carbon effectively without damaging the surface. And then also by using a solvent or chemical, we, we can't. So, because if you use another chemical, that would be another contamination, you see? Yeah, because a, a lot of the solvent is made of carbon. And if you're trying to remove the carbon by using a carbon, it's gonna be another carbon contamination. Yeah, unfortunately. Thank you. Okay, next question. How long does an implant stay decontaminated? If it stays decontaminated long enough, could it be, um, pre-treated before being shipped from the supplier? That's a good question. Question is, we can't. As short as two hours, the implant started to degrade. So when you when you monitor the hydrophilicity, you will you will know it. That's why the implant should be in, uh, placed into the patient within two hours after activation, uh, which means there's no way for the manufacturer to activate ahead of time in a factory, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, next question. What is your recommendation for standard load time? Standard so loading time, yes. In animal model, animal model indicated three time acceleration of OS integration in, at the early stage. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's animal model. And obviously we can apply that in terms of acceleration, but the how much, how many times that will be different between the animal and the human. And then uh, the one of the research, a clinical study that I presented indicated ISQ value comparison indicated 
uh, we got uh, three time acceleration or much more than acceleration in challenging cases. That's why in challenging cases, particularly because you know primary stability is pretty low, that's why you can consider uh, the, the very good, the decent healing time instead of six months or eight months, because sometimes we have to wait, right? If the challenging case is like a simultaneous GBR, but we can probably research indicated, we can accelerate it uh, to half of it. Yeah, that's the research indicated. And about the regular cases, you know, when you apply the animal research data, of course you can, you can apply the correct acceleration. But the thing is, you know, I wouldn't say the definitive number uh, because we're going to have to wait uh, the clinical trial study by using uh, VUB. But I okay. can tell yeah, it will be faster. Yeah. Okay, next question. Do you have any long-term data, example studies looking at late uh, failures pre-implantitis? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I think it's several, uh, the clinical research publications uh, reported uh, seven-year uh, data uh, the results yeah, from the Yokohama University in Japan. And um, oh, that was a particular patient, though, that implants are placed into the cancer patients. It's a challenging cases. And uh, there was a, the great uh, the advantage by using uh, the UV. So it's a seven-year uh, data. That's why that can tell us some message. It, it's good. You know, the failure rate was was actually improved by the UV and the uh, loading time was improved by the UV. Yes. And then I think it's a lot of uh, the, the research will be you know, planned from now on. That's why I'm really looking forward, you know, five year, 10 year, uh, 15 year results. But, but uh, uh, theoretically, we have no or speculation of a bad speculation, adverse effects by the UV. So, you know, physically, chemically, it, it's all good. And, uh, oh, maybe I didn't mention that, but, you know, the, the marginal bone stability is also enhanced as well. You know, that's a the, the data from the Korean university there. And that, that way we can prevent the, the bone recession an aesthetic damage for long run. That's something we can uh, we can get the implication, even though we, we still have to wait for the long term clinical study. But you know, just giving the implication. Yes. Okay, we have um, last question. If you guys wanted to add any more question, just you know, just message us on the Q and A board. So the next one is: Do other implant parts? abutment, crown, et cetera, come in DO package to be used for UVV? I'm sorry, yeah, yes, you definitely, you know, you, the DO UV is not made for abutments or healing abutments, final abutment, temporary abutments, or other components. However, you know, theoretically, we can apply as long as it's a titanium based material. As long as a titanium based material, we can apply the UV because th there's no harm on it. Yeah, there's no harm on it for sure. And then we can increase the hydrophilicity like I presented today. And then also we can uh, decarbonize the surface. That's why uh, all of the biological res uh, response are pretty good to the clean surface, uh, to, to the hydrophilic surface. And uh, also, we can make the bacterial fibricity as well. That's why uh, so far, uh, we do not see any reason not to apply UV to other components. Uh, we, although we're still waiting for a lot of data coming, but a lot of data is already ongoing. And then like I showed today, initial data uh, shows a very positive effect. Yes. Okay, that's our last question. Um, if you guys have any other questions, just let us know. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ogawa is here. It's a very um, good opportunity that you could ask all the questions that you might, you know, like want clarifications. 
Uh, Dr. Ogawa, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I'm, I'm sorry. The one I skipped is that the UV treatment can really improve the blood and protein flow. I would say recruitment. You know, the reason we had a lot of air bubbles, the reason we had a lot of void of us integration will be explained by the things. You know, I will, in the future, I will show you the video that, you know, kind of blood flow video. And the thing is, by, you know, using a VUV, probably we could improve the, the macro design of the implants in the future. You see that? Because with or without VUV, like I said, blood circulation will change. If that's the case, we can probably optimize more the thread thread shape, thread pitch, or angulation, or a lot of uh, macro factor of the implant design can be improved because based on this will be the hydrophilic implants, right? But until now, because they designed it based on this is a hydrophobic implants, right? That's what people in the world did. But from now on, it'll be hydrophilic implants will be the common sense. And then a lot of effect will be coming. Good effects will be coming. That's what we're expecting. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. Um, also wanted to tell you guys that we're going to have seminar with um, Dr. Ogawa um, starting in February. We're going to send out information about that on your email. So if you wanted to join us, we're going to have it throughout the East Coast and the West Coast. We'll send the information um, soon after the holiday season. So again, thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Ogawa, for helping us like understand more about the UV activation. Thank you, Andres. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank See you so you. much, guys.